Thank you for joining us today. As you probably just got the notification as well, the meeting will be recorded. Um, and so just want to acknowledge that before we begin. My name is Jackson Chabot, and I'm a Transportation Policy Associate at Open Plan. Um, so like I said, welcome, as you see on the screen, to the future of New York City streets. At Open Plans, we use tactical urbanism, grassroots advocacy, policy, and targeted journalism and media to promote structural reforms within city government. And so today, we're so pleased to be co-hosting this panel with the American Transportation, uh, American Planning, oh my gosh, I'm the, I'm the treasurer of the APA New York Metro chapter, and I can't even say it correctly, so wow. Um, but in any event, I want to give a special shout out to Katie and Dora and their team of the Transportation Committee of the APA New York Metro chapter. They are uh, wonderful co-hosts in all things that we do. And so uh, special thanks to them, as well as to our uh, guests and panelists today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dora, and she is going to kick us off. Thank you, Dora. Thanks, Jackson. As Jackson mentioned, I'm Dora Makita, the co-chair of the APA New York Metro Chapters Transportation Committee. And I'm also joined by Katie Braden, the other co-chair of the committee. So a few housekeeping items before we jump into the discussion. Please keep your microphones muted throughout the discussion. Uh, there will be a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the discussion where uh, we'll be taking questions from the audience. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the discussion, please feel free to write them in the chat and uh, we'll address them during the Q&A period. If you prefer to ask your questions directly, you can uh, use the raise hand function in Zoom. So um, when you do that, we will uh, call on you and you can please unmute yourself then. Uh, if you're an AICP certified planner, you'll have the opportunity to earn 1.25 CM credits from the session. On the APA website, you can search for the event using the event number 9218367. And uh, we have that on the screen for you as well. Additionally, uh, like Jackson had mentioned, today's webinar will be recorded and we'll be posting it on the Transportation Committee's YouTube page for distance learning uh, AICP CM credits. So if you have any friends or colleagues who weren't able to join in person today, that option is available to, to them. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Leanne Farhi. Leanne is a senior transportation planner at Sam Schwartz, specializing in public space design, complete streets, and placemaking. She has a multidisciplinary background and 10 years of experience practicing architecture, urban design, and multimodal transportation planning in the private and public sectors. She has designed, implemented, and managed a range of real-world projects to create safe, livable, and future-ready streets, and has conducted quality of life studies to quantify the benefits of public realm improvements on uh, community health, safety, and economic vitality. And now I'll turn it over to Leanne to introduce today. Thank you so much, Dora, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, please welcome our panelists for today. We have with us David Vega, Vega Barakovitz, uh, Emily Weindenhoff, and Jennifer to Tosing. For uh, David, David is the director of the urban design at WXY Architecture and Urban Design Firm, and adjunct professor of urban design and planning at Syracuse University. As a city planner and an urban designer, David, David's works explore the instrumentality of codes in shaping the built environment. His practice focuses on uh, development of new tools, research methods, and design perspective that investigate and challenge the DNA of cities from zoning and building codes to streets uh, and engineering manuals. So welcome, David. Um, also, Emily Weinderhoff, she's the Director of Public Space at the New York City DOT, working closely with community organization throughout the five borough to transform their streets and public space. Her focus uh, for 
more than a decade, has been in the role of public realm in strengthening communities from plazas and shared streets uh, to retooling the curb lane and in innovative programming and concessions. Uh, most recently, Emily led the creation of pandemic res uh, response programs to support neighborhoods and businesses citywide, including the open restaurants and the open streets. Uh, welcome, Emily. Uh, Jennifer is the Director of Community and Economic Development for Montefiore Health System. She, in addition, she's also the Executive Director of the Jerome Gunn Hill Business De uh, Improvement District, which surrounds the main campus of Montefiore Medical Center uh, in the Bronx. Jennifer works closely with all relevant stakeholders to create and implement quality of life initiative um, to improve the overall health of the community for those who live and work in the area. So welcome, Jennifer. Today's discussion um, is gonna focus on three main things. Um, the first topics that we're gonna explore is how, uh, how have our streets changed um, in terms of the street uses, um, the public uh, perception of streets, uh, how did government change due to pandemic and other recent social movements. We, are, we also want to explore balancing different street uses. Um, how, how can planners balance between the com competing needs on streets and space uh, for movement versus um, street as destinations? And uh, we're going to look into the future, into best practices, into the new uh, coming administration, and evolving ideas around street management. So I'm going to start with an open question to all the panelists. Um, how has COVID shaped the way cities uh, view public space management? Who would like to start? I will call on Jennifer, maybe she could She's get kicked. Sure. Um, so thank you all for having me. It's so nice to, to see you all, a bunch of other, a bunch of be among among planners. Uh, it's, it's been a little bit since I've been out of school. So I'm happy to be part of this group. Um, so yeah, I mean, our, our streets have, have changed a lot, right? Um, you know, I was part of the, the mayor's uh, advisory council on surface transportation. And even just uh, the number of subgroups that were part of that, um, that were part of that council really sort of spoke to all of, I think what we'll talk about some of the competing uses um, for outdoor space, right? When it was, when it was very clear that um, outdoors in groups was, was dangerous. I mean, indoors in groups was dangerous, but outdoor in groups was okay, right? It really um, kind of shifted how we all look at outdoor space. Um, and so kind of, you know, it, it felt like, during the pandemic, kind of everything was on the table to really take a take a, a look at um, and see what kind of changes we could make. And I think, um, you know, while it doesn't happen quickly because this is New York City, but I, I do think that there are a lot of good ideas that came out of that group. And I think that DOT has started to um, plan and and think about implementing um, everything from you know open streets and open culture to freight management and last mile deliveries and um, you know, public plazas and, you know, and, and really everything in between. Um, so I think that there are some of those things in place and I think we'll continue to see um, the results of some of those planning that, some of that planning that of course came out of a crisis, um, but uh, planning, that, planning that is happening nonetheless. So we're looking forward to continuing to working with the city um, on some of these bigger projects. Great. Um, Emily, would you like to build on that? Sure. Um, I, I mean, I think, you know, in a really fascinating um, and um, uh, um, exciting way we saw, particularly with restaurants pre-pandemic, you know, there had been a kind of planning and zoning layer to where we thought, um, you know, it made sense for restaurants on the street. And during the pandemic, lifting that and kind of giving everybody an opportunity to participate and to, um, you know, use their uh, their streets and and their sidewalks, I think was really an amazing, um, amazingly encouraging and, and, and amazingly transformative. Um, we saw the the kind of love and 
care um, that restaurants and the hospitality industry kind of put into their, um, you know, dining environment. They brought that out on onto the street, um, and I think you know everybody, everybody here um, experienced and recognized um, the amazing, um, the amazing transformation um, across the city. So I think you know that that expanded geography um, was huge. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the other thing that, that we saw firsthand was people who, for more than a decade, uh, who never kind of wanted to rethink or, or use their street in any way other than, you know, the way they drove home. Um, finally, some of those, um, you know, a, a lot of those, those folks let go and saw that there was a much um, kind of wider, more diverse and ultimately more, um, you know, more valuable use for our streets. And so I think we're continuing to see that, um, you know, that, that mindset um, and that shift um, really play out as, as we advance projects moving forward in a really exciting way. Thank you, Emily. Um, David, any thoughts? Yeah, and, and again, thank you for, for having me on the panel. And I think Jennifer and Emily touched on a lot of the themes that I, I, I think are obviously really important in, in terms of what we've seen in public space and on streets in this past year. I mean, as Emily was saying, I think there's been an incredible kind of opening and awakening of minds. People are suddenly in, in ways, and I think at a scale that we hadn't seen previously, not just in New York, but in other places, suddenly thinking like, oh, wow, the parking lot next to the chilies that I work at is also a public space and the place in front of my restaurant that I, you know, held on to for years because it, uh, you know, was a critical reservoir of parking for customers is an extension of my business. I mean, that that's a sea change and it's not something that we've seen, I think, really since the 1950s and 60s when there was the sort of early pedestrian mall experiments that you know failed and, and people never went back to um, that we've seen this kind of sudden interest and enthusiasm for how we can really reshape the kind of underlying design parameters of streets and I think you know as a design firm we're we're excited to see streets I think living up to their role as a framework of possibilities you know all of these whether it's a restaurant that put $2,000 of money into something that's pretty lightweight and flexible or someone that, you know, built out a maybe uh, non-compliant semi-permanent structure in the right of way. There's, uh, there's an architectural variety to streets that I think is exciting and it's ultimately good for cities. Uh, at the same time, we've seen, I think, seen a closing uh, in a way. People are um, probably for the first time since the 1920s have suddenly had a fear of public space um, from a public health perspective. Uh, and I think that that's uh, in some ways carried over to um, questions of safety that people are, are, are now experiencing. And so the kind of culture of public space has changed in ways that are uh, both incredibly open and positive, but, but also um, potentially problematic for how we interact with one, or one another in the future. And definitely, I think, give a lot of people that have seen placemaking in public space, um, I think, become more mainstream as things that people accept as good for business and good for the culture of cities as coming into question. Um, the other thing I'd mention, and it's just, I think everyone has seen it over the past year, is this incredible diversification in mobility devices that people are using. And so, you know, not only uh, I think did that um, kind of fear of taking the subway produce this huge profusion of scooters and e-bikes and uh, an, an interest in a different kind of multi-modality in a way. Um, but I think that that's something that will continue to um, present some opportunities, but also some challenges in terms of how we manage streets, how we think about congestion, how we um, think about the opportunities for different lighter weight, more electric modes on our streets. That's a really good point and a good uh, segue to the next question. So how should planners approach prioritiz prioritizing and balancing street uses or maybe even different modes in the, in the streets? Um, 
just some recent example worldwide we've seen in Barcelona the super blocks uh, that restrict vehicles in the neighborhood uh, streets. We also have New York examples. One of them is 14th Street Transit and Track Priority Corridor, and then Union Square Partnership that uh, recently released a vision plan that builds on the success. So again, from your perspective, how do you think planners should approach this balancing act? I mean, I'll just jump in to say, I think something um, exciting that is definitely um, new for New York City is starting to think about um, and, and prioritize different streets for different uses. You know, we have so many streets and we have so many very wide streets um, that, you know, in a lot of ways for, for many years, it was like um, a, a kind of complete street model and let's kind of make room for everyone on a corridor. And I think some of the interesting um, um, developments that we're seeing, especially through some of our successful open streets is that you start to get this like primary secondary um, corridors um, in, in neighborhoods that allow us to um, both think about um, neighborhoods and the public realm um, in, in, in a larger scale um, that then we have we have done before, but it also presents kind of opportunities to start to carve out more space um, and more flexibility for different modes of of travel and different um, public realm uses. When you start to look at um, again the kind of uh, either you know um, super block type model or, or district scale um, or just the, the pair the corridor pairing scales of like maybe a commercial and bus corridor um, and then a bike and ped priority corridor um, that I think has really unlocked a lot of a lot of thinking and a, and a lot of opportunity um, for a kind of diverse uses and, and modes moving forward. Okay. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just react to that also in, in, in the, the, the sort of importance I think of open streets, it, and obviously to, to uh, credit to Emily and her team and sort of facilitating that program in, I think, paving the way for a larger scale, uh, more permanent way of thinking around shared streets and pedestrian priority streets in a place like New York City is just a huge opportunity. And I think that, um, you know, with the closures, uh, temporary or otherwise, that we've seen on Broadway or Manhattan, parts of the Lower East Side and, and in neighborhoods all throughout the city. Uh, I mean, I think we're, you know, we now have the opportunity to think, build on those successes and create the kind of clear modal priority framework that I think has been success, you know, has been successful for many years in European cities and increasingly other cities around the US have been embracing as sort of a hallmark of their approach to street design. So that's, that's an incredible, thing that I think we're going to see continue to evolve the next five, 10 years. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I'm going to have a question for Jennifer. Um, so most streets uses support the local economy. For example, we have Cider Cafe that support local uh, storefronts, uh, while we have some vehicular and curb lane to support uh, freight needs. Um, how are New York City bids using streets as economic development tool and supporting the economic uh, recovery of New York City? Yeah, um, so there are 76 bids in New York City and I would say um, there are very few things that we all agree on because um, we're as you know different and diverse as, as really as the neighborhoods that we serve. Um, but I will say, you know, everybody really was on board of course, with some of the open streets and open restaurants, we pushed really hard um, for the open storefronts, which I think um, is a really great replacement for the sidewalk cafe. The sidewalk cafe um, licensing is can be fairly restrictive and very expensive. So replacing it with something that's a little bit uh, easier to use um, has helped um, more businesses be able to, to access it and to take advantage of it. Um, and even, you know, open culture, right? It's like, really, we were really able to work with the city and think outside the box about all of the different things that we could do um, in the streets, in the curb lane, on the sidewalks that were going to 
you know, help um, generate commerce um, and, and make people feel safe um, in, in going shopping. Um, I can say for, in my bid, we, um, we worked with a volunteer architecture collaborative um, who really took a look at, came up to, came up to the, up to the bid and took a look at some internal and external ways that we could, stores could retrofit so that they didn't have just, you know, a, a piece of saran wrap in between them, the cash register and the customer, right? And really look at different kinds of design interventions that would look nice, but also, um, you know, make, make people feel safe. And so I think, um, and we did that in, in some of our stores. We also did that out um, in the public realm. We, we found some um, basically abandoned abandoned public space that we were able to turn into a um, a new park a new parklet or the new street seats program, um, and so I think um, people have been really really creative, um, and uh, you know again with the with really the the emphasis on things happening outdoors and bids bids um, extensive experience in managing public spaces public plazas. Um, we're really able to sort of level up a lot of the programming um, and, you know, really take advantage of, of people wanting to be outside in, in public spaces. Um, and we're hoping, you know, we're hoping that people come back to the office because um, that's really going to be a big, um, a big boost for particularly a lot of our uh, Manhattan and Midtown bids and commercial districts. Um, I think uh, they're, they're still suffering um, pretty badly with people not being in the office. So, but even that, you know, I was, I was in uh, Grand Central District last night and they still had in their public plaza, you know, musicians playing and outdoor chairs set up and, you know, on a Wednesday, like just really trying to encourage people to be outside. Um, there's been a lot of new public art projects um, that we've been able to uh, curate across the city to, again, to just really bring people outside and into the district um, and encourage them to, to shop locally, which I think, you know, given that I think during the pandemic, a lot of people really sort of stayed in their neighborhoods, um, so it did sort of help some of those local outer borough neighborhoods um, that that maybe don't always have as high foot traffic as, as our Manhattan business districts. So yeah, do you see different approaches among the New York City bids? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I said, we're very different. I, the, the smallest bid we have up here in the Bronx is, um, has about a hundred and ten thousand dollar budget, and then you know we have our friends in Manhattan that have uh, multi million dollar budgets. So there's definitely um, a scale uh, that's that's different. And I think you know people are responding to the needs of their of their local communities, right? That's not a, it's certainly not a one size fits all. Like everyone needs to have this specific public art program. So yeah, I think I think people have gotten really creative um, and done lots of had, had lots of different kinds of interventions. I know. My colleague Jeffrey from the Meatpacking, who's on here, did like a gorgeous flower show, um, and that is, you know, something that was near and dear to him and and his district, and which is something that like I couldn't pull off up here in the Bronx, right? So, um, but there's also, you know, a, among the bids, I will say we really came together this year in a way that we never have before, despite our despite that we have an association um, that we come together and advocate for policy and programming that affect all of our stakeholders, but. Um, so we really this year were able to come together and and learn from each other and um, and share best practices and share ideas um, about what we were doing in different districts for in case it was replicable in other places. So that was something that really felt like a silver lining that came out of this for us. Yeah, that's that's really um, great. Um, I have a question for David. It's about flexibility. It's often uh, used as a way to manage uh, competing uses of streets, uh, flexible curb uses as a way to manage deliveries, flexibility to open a street to pedestrians over the weekends. How can flexibility in design be useful? Thanks, Leanne. Um, and you know, this, this kind of question of flexibility, I think certainly in the post COVID context is something that a lot of us have been thinking about. Like we're seeing this incredible variety of flexible uses that have taken place. And we want to find a way uh, as best we can to kind of begin to institutionalize those kinds of flexible street management structures. At the same time, you know, transportation as a field and street design in particular is sort of built around standardization, rules, regulations, 
um, you know, a certain number of feet for each lane, a certain peak hour volume that you have to accommodate. And so there is this kind of balance when thinking about curbside management, when thinking about traffic planning, where flexibility and predictability both have um, important, important attributes that we kind of need to be aware of. Um, and there are times when too much flexibility can be a problem. You, know, you think about uh, all the cities that have had scooters and dockless bikes littered around their streets. Um, you think about um, some of the issues around package management uh, and deliveries that we've seen uh, really present problems in neighborhoods. At the same time, I think we're at this turning point where uh, not only is the notion of the curb as a space for flexibility, both in terms of design, outdoor dining, um, and management has, has sort of really um, become more prevalent and more accepted. But we're at a point where technologically, um, we, we are at the cusp of being able to really shift from a paradigm where you have a sort of rigid parking regulation that hasn't changed in 20 years to one where we may actually be able through the use of technology to begin to encode regulations in the curb and manage them more flexibly. And so I think that one of the things that um, we also think about deeply as a design driver are the kind of uh, small details from a design perspective that can be built into streets to make them inherently more flexible. And I mentioned uh, this issue of pedestrian priority in shared streets earlier, but there are ways uh, in which a design, a, a, an environment can be designed um, and, you know, the meatpacking district came up earlier um, to kind of inherently um, have a bit more flexibility in terms of the way that they're managed, the way that people move through them. Um, when you think about so many aspects of our environment, whether that be crosswalks and signalization or lane widths and medians, um, there, there, there's a kind of rigidity in, uh, in, in street design um, that I think we're, we're beginning to erode from a design perspective. Uh, and to balance this kind of emphasis on fixed objects and emphasis on um, kind of setting people apart uh, towards a more fluid environment in places like Broadway and Lower Manhattan and the Meatpacking District that I think enable transportation and streets to behave in some ways the, the way they kind of want to behave. Um, and so that's what we're excited about. Um, in terms of seeing kind of the, the way in which flexibility will continue to evolve uh, and influence the, the way that we think about curbside management, the way that we think about pedestrian district planning. Thank you, David. This is uh, super interesting. I'm going to have a question for Emily. It's uh, about the open street. So it received a lot of positive recognition, uh, particularly during COVID. Do you see opportunities to expand this program? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, so much of, of what David said is, is super relevant and we, we talked about this a little bit before, but for us, open streets really hit a frequency that resonated um, kind of in a new geography, a new scale. Um, it is, it, it affords us a tool that is um, light touch and flexible enough um, and in a way that has been different than, than many of our other um, uh, public space programs at, at DOT um, that has, has really kind of um, unlocked, I think, um, some big growth potentials. Um, the first is really geography. Um, so, you know, our, the kind of precursor predecessor to Open Streets was our weekend walk program, which was, you know, a couple, a couple weekends um, a month uh, during the summer, our great partners, um, bids and, and other merchants associations and neighborhood groups um, would, would pedestrianize their street for, um, you know, half a, half a day or so. Um, what, um, you know, what we're, we're finding is that um, this kind of limited local access, um, the, the ability to let folks still have access to their, um, you know, to their driveways or parking garages or to their parking spaces on the street, um, but really manage it in a, in a super light touch way um, has allowed us to get to neighborhoods who may have been, you know, against 
of foreclosure, um, but it's also allowed a lot of other kind of lighter touch volunteer organizations um, to kind of get, get in the game. And so we've seen this great expansion um, of a kind of residential typology of open streets where neighborhoods are um, uh, managing and promoting just slow speed local access corridors in their neighborhood. So, you know, finding um, great ways for people to walk and bike, um, again, at that kind of larger corridor scale. Um, and so we're, we're very excited um, to kind of develop these, these, these typologies further um, and definitely in neighborhoods um, that don't have bids and, and where we haven't worked before. So I think, you know, a huge part um, as well with the, um, with the growth of the program, um, thanks to uh, council's legislation um, and, and funding of open streets moving forward, um, we will also be able to, the city will be able to, um, you know, be supportive um, of, of these types of programs, um, light touch, light touch um, kind of pedestrianization um, that will then allow us to really work and plan with communities. Um, and so as, as slow going um, as Broadway has been, for example, um, you know, we've, we've for, for many, oh, over a decade now, been working on, um, you know, a vision for a, a bicycle and pedestrian priority corridor along Broadway from Union Square all the way up to Columbus Circle. Um, there has been this amazing kind of opportunity of being able to stick with these projects and being able to evolve the design over time, you know, as the, the neighborhoods and the city and the businesses um, change, uh, change course with the updates that we make, um, we've been able to do more and more. So I think we're really excited to see how um, new geographies, new larger scales, again, corridor, um, you know, multi-block approaches, to, um, to thinking about um, transportation and public realm planning uh, of streets um, with really going along with, with neighborhoods, um, I think presents a, a really great opportunity in terms of yeah, scale, geography, um, and a typology of public realm improvements moving forward. Catching on this typology, I'm wondering how can New York City use uh, quick build and more tactical urbanism ideas to experiment with new new ways to use our streets? Yeah, I mean we are we are actively um, we are actively uh, pushing and, um, and and exploring that option. I mean it, we we definitely acknowledge that the uh, you know the metal French barricade um, is not an ideal tool. You know it. it it, it, it served its purpose kind of for the past uh, year and a half, but I think everybody, uh, our partners included, um, and certainly us are ready to, to move on. Um, and so it's exciting to see some groups um, test out some different tools, but really I think we have, um, we have a good um, light touch toolkit that we're looking to modify. Um, and again, I think, you know, David, as you've mentioned now a couple of times, um, the shared, shared streets for us and the kind of self-enforcing slow speed type light touch design treatments from chokers to chicanes, um, things that can be put down relatively easily, um, but create an environment where you don't have to like constantly, you know, be people um, coming out at, you know, whatever, 6 a.m. to move, move, drag, you know, drag the barricades back and forth um, uh, to be able to both, um, yeah, create um, more robust slow speed environments, but ones that are ultimately easier to manage as well. Um, and I will say, I mean, we're very excited about, um, you know, some of the treatments. Toronto, for example, has some really great um, kind of uh, more residential scaled chicanes um, that, allow for the roadway drainage to remain intact where the maintenance is about maintaining plants versus you know maintaining heavy barricades and I know for a lot of a lot of neighborhoods a lot of community groups um, you know watering a few plants is, is much more exciting and realistic than um, you know some of the other traffic safety elements um, you know so I think we're we're also very excited um, 
to explore that direction as well. And ultimately, um, you know, with, with some of our most successful open streets, I think the question becomes as we look um, to the long term, um, you know, are there ways that we can renovate instead of fully reconstruct? Um, because, I, you know, anyone um, uh, who has undergone any kind of capital project in, in New York City, uh, whether it be by your home or work or what have you, it's always the question is, why is this taking so long? Um, and so I think, you know, are, th are there ways that we can start to, even beyond the, our paint and gravel and, and our light touch um, materials that you see there now, are there other kind of light touch treatments that are maybe a bit more permanent but don't necessarily um, you know, take millions and millions and millions of dollars and 10 years to, to execute. Um, and so I think that that concept of renovation um, is one that um, will be really exciting to explore um, over the next few years as well. Yeah, I definitely hear you about the benefits versus the amount of effort and time that uh, projects uh, such as capital project take. Um, so I'm gonna open it to a few uh, more questions to, to all of you. Um, how can streets center safety, care, and healing for all New Yorkers from different ages, race, and abilities? And I think it's also related to one of the comments that we got in the chat that is related to people with disabilities. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start off on this one. I mean, I, I think that when it comes to accessibility, in, on, on New York City streets, you know, we, we have an intense problem because there is a, a real issue in New York City around street clutter. Um, and for anyone that's worked down, uh, you know, a street in Midtown or a uh, you know, narrow street in, one, in, in the outer boroughs, uh, there, there's a tremendous amount of, uh, you know, whether they be sidewalk sheds or trash that are cluttering the street or, streets that aren't in great condition. And, and, and this is a huge, a huge equity issue um, in terms of really making the environment usable, making it comfortable, making it enjoyable. Um, part of it, I think, really does begin with thinking about creative street management and curbside management tools. Are there places where we can widen sidewalks to create uh, a more comfortable environment? Are there regulations that really need to be looked at in depth to prevent uh, the kind of adverse conditions that, uh, you know, sidewalk sheds and other sort of street clutter that obviously is well-intentioned, but sometimes can have adverse consequences um, can be addressed. And then are there places uh, citywide where we can pinpoint where these issues are, are maybe most acute? I think thinking a little bit more broadly beyond access and accessibility, um, you know, New York City streets are there. You know, we kind of say this a lot, but they are truly New Yorkers front yards. Um, and I think that uh, it's it's revealing when you look at maps of New York City to see um, how many streets in the city lack appropriate shade cover and are just absolutely inundated with heat during the summer. How many places in New York City are far out of reach of a park that has appropriate shade, especially in the sort of hot summer months. Um, there's a huge opportunity to, you know, as Emily said, start thinking about this kind of toolkit and an expanded toolkit that can begin to address issues of comfort um, more equitably across New York City streets and across New York City neighborhoods. Um, and that can kind of really help New Yorkers live up to this notion of the street as a place that does serve as a front yard, that does sort of serve as a community gathering space, and that has the potential to kind of both from a design perspective, but then also from a management perspective, um, really feel comfortable and accessible for everyone that wants to use them. This is great. Thank you, David. Jennifer? Just, yeah, just to piggyback on that, right? Like, I think it really has to be, um, a holistic approach, right? To David's great example of shade, right? But it's also like, if you look at trash pickups and, and the, the difference between how often the trash gets picked up in the outer boroughs versus, you know, in other, uh, you know, other more central districts, it's like, there's a lot of disparity there and to, to the point of it, you know, this being people's yards and they're, you know, 
full of trash and rats. And you know, I know that there's, of course, conversation at the city of that happening. Um, I think it's, um, you know, th that's sort of one example. Another is, is, you know, a lot of the illegal commerce that's happening on the streets right now, right? It's really difficult to navigate um, up here. We have a, we have a, um, a large senior housing um, complex that really relies on all the stores in our bid to, you know, meet their daily needs. And it's really hard to walk, let alone, you know, be able to, you know, navigate a wheelchair um, or other kinds of, um, people with other kinds of mobility issues. So it, it really is like, uh, you know, in, in my view, in this moment, really uh, um, taking a look at all of the city services and making sure that they're distributed equitably um, and that people are, that we're enforcing the laws that exist so that it's not sort of chaos on the street and in the curb lane. And that doesn't feel like it's, it's happening so much right now. Yeah, and I'll just I'll just jump in to say um, that I, I think definitely we are um, excited to be moving um, beyond pandemic response into kind of the permanent stages of these programs. Um, certainly, when there were very few people on our streets, um, you know, it it made a lot of sense to have um, dining on sidewalks and in the roadway. But certainly, as people are coming back. Um, we're starting to get, get the volumes and the congestion um, that really, um, uh, you know, um, require us to think about and prioritize um, pedestrian mobility, um, uh, you know, especially as, as more people can, can be eating inside and restaurants can kind of um, regain a lot of their original capacity. Um, so that's definitely something um, that, that we're very actively thinking about, particularly, um, you know, as we, we migrate to the, the permanent open restaurant program. Um, you know, and, and some things are, are easier. I mean, I'll just uh, jump in to say that, you know, also snow, right? That's another, um, the equal distribution of services, um, but also like, um, you know, I'm sure everybody has uh, encountered the very slushy, difficult to cross uh, pedestrian ramps or un, um, you know, unshoveled bike lanes and things like that. So. Um, also just another, another realm of, of, of comfort and, um, and prioritizing um, many different uses on our streets. Um, you know, and then there are, uh, I think, more challenging um, accessibility issues. Um, you know, one we face a lot um, is, um, you know, the Getting back to David's point about too much flexibility, you know, our so so many of our plaza spaces um, thrive because they are flexible and kind of constantly and consistently programmed and can shift around and um, you know accommodate so many different uses. Uh, but that type of flexibility and unpredictability can pose um, a big challenge and be quite confusing for folks with visual impairments. Um, so I think you know ultimately that's. Um, a concern we've we've heard um, on an ongoing basis, particularly with a lot of our, our temporary projects. So I think there's still a lot of work to be done there in terms of trying to find solutions that can make allow these spaces to be flexible um, and and vibrant um, while also being more inclusive of, of a whole variety of users. I agree. This is a big challenge in in all this new typologies that we're putting down on the streets become a navigation challenge for, for visually impaired. Um, I'm wondering if you have any best practices of effective policy or design consideration from other cities that you could, that you think could be applied to New York City. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start off. I, I mean, I think one of the areas, and we've kind of alluded to it a number of times, that I, I do think that New York City has an opportunity in the next administration to really be thinking about is you know, there, there is this huge amount of energy that's been put into tactical elements, into um, you know robust on-street protected bike lanes, open streets. Um, and there are so many cities around the country that I think have built really effective and exemplary capital programs 
um, that I think are, are worth referring to both for their best practices, but also the way in which they've actually designed these things. And I think of, um, and some of these places are obviously smaller and have different challenges than New York City, but you know, a place like Cambridge, Massachusetts has just an incredibly powerful program for building and reconstructing crosswalks and has this you know, raised crosswalks that they've built um, to, to really slow streets entering their neighborhoods um, while also creating additional public space. We've seen uh, the city of Seattle has one of the most ambitious green infrastructure programs and is really thinking about green infrastructure as a tool, not just for sort of dealing uh, with stormwater and treating stormwater, but also creating really interesting and kind of unique public spaces through that provision. I think the other area where, um, you know, there are a number of other cities that we can look to, um, to really learn from is in sort of understanding the intersection between uh, land use and transportation policy. Uh, and, you know, certainly, as somebody who's dealt a lot with New York City's zoning code, I'm always kind of amazed to see how much parking is still required in New York. And there are just a significant number of cities across the country that have either done away with their parking minimums entirely or really created mechanisms to heavily reduce them while, you know, better meeting affordable housing targets and, and, and reallocating that space to other uses. So I think that those three things really for me, uh, along with you know expanding the city's um, ever expanding bikeway network in a more permanent fashion, I, would be kind of the the four top priorities. Yeah, I'll just jump in to say I completely agree um, with the you know strengthening the relationship between land use and transportation um, a thousand percent. I think. Obviously, the, the increased uh, demand um, for, for our, our curb space, um, for, for our street space, um, as we think to everything from electric vehicle charging to package uh, delivery, um, the kind of hub and spoke distribution points, um, you know, I think there's a really um, tremendous opportunity to be thinking about some of the um, land use and zoning codes kind of being rethought to serve and support um, some of these, these types of uses so that we can keep our streets more flexible and more open for um, uh, you know, uh, cycling, public transit, um, more, more pedestrian space, um, et cetera. Um, I think the other thing um, that uh, would be hugely helpful um, and, and, and many cities have, have um, kind of developed um, a really robust cost benefit um, analysis. So we can really be um, vocal advocates um, kind of both in, inside um, an administration, but also to the public about, you know, what these types of improvements actually deliver to, to the city um, and really um, leverage um, that, that message and, and all of those benefits. I don't, you know, everybody here, uh, we probably don't need to, you know, to explain at all the kind of multi-level, everything from public health and mental health and, um, you know, early, early education to, you know, safety, that when we enhance the public realm, we are supporting um, communities and all of these different layers. But I think being able to have um, more, more quantitative data to be able to, um, to back that up and, and, and speak to um, these making these benefits is is also hugely important. Thank you, Emily. Jennifer, anything to add? Um, yeah, I mean, just just that you know, I think that the city has a lot of the right ideas, right? Like a lot of like the new micro mobility and electric car charging, right? And it's and it's and and the bus redesign and a new and new bike lanes and like so that's all being rolled out i think just the, the devil is always in the details right so the way it gets implemented um i think will be you know really key to its success or not i have another thing to add which is something that uh, to learn from other places about best practices um 
bring the city of London. They've been doing a lot of good work around using private development uh, in the process of improving the public realm around the developments. So I think there is a lesson to learn there how to um, build on that um, already ongoing you know, projects and um, kind of have a holistic approach towards improvement. Um, let me uh, ask another kind of a question that targets our audience here. So how can, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> how can planners support New York City in creating policy and programs that uh, support lively street life uh, for the future than the decades to come? I'll, I'll sort of start off and, you know, we've kind of been in some ways circling around this issue um, and it gets to something that Jennifer was sort of referring to, which is the devils in the details. And one of the big things that I've been kind of amazed to see with open restaurants and open streets really across the country is this issue of scale. Um, and I think that whether you're talking about electric vehicle charging or you're talking about bike corrals or chicanes or city bike scale is really critical. And I think one of the surprising and in some ways untapped mechanisms to achieve scale that uh, we really saw in action this past year was this kind of citizen powered, civic empowered um, way of actually involving people and in improving their own streets. And, you know, to Emily's earlier point that sometimes too much flexibility can result in a, a level of chaos, if not, you know, actual safety issues. Um, I do think that that's something that we, um, as a city, um, as a culture also just need to find new ways to embrace and structure and create these kind of mechanisms that can, um, create sort of citizen advocates that are actually playing a big role in managing uh, and sort of serving as stewards for their streets because it's incredibly powerful and I think that people are willing to invest their time, their energy, their actual money um, in improving the places that are in front of their business or in front of their home when there's the right process in place to tap into that. Um, but, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a need to continue to sort of experiment around how those kinds of things can be delivered at a citizen level uh, and delivered eventually at scale to really realize a sea change in the way that we think about streets and the way that we think about transportation. Yeah, this is it. I totally agree. I think, you know, every neighborhood is different. Um, and so really taking into account the people who live there and what they want in their streets. Um, and, you know, I think we really heavily in New York City rely on the community board model, which I don't think works in every um, in every district, right? The, those community boards are not always representative of what everyone in the community wants to hear and I think, or wants to see. And I think, you know, planners are uniquely positioned, you know, given our um, experience and, and um, methods to do like real community engagement and real community development and, and um, get real feedback from people on a hyper local level and let uh, people who live in the in the area really um, influence what happens you know in their homes in their front yards um, and and move away from this sort of you know box checking of we presented the community board and they voted and it's fine um, and, and not getting as much real, real feedback as possible. Yeah, big is hard. New York City is so big. Like I just, you know, that is something that, um, you know, everyone obviously who works in New York City knows that and, and feels that. Um, and, uh, you know, during the, um, the beginning of the pandemic, when it felt like, um, you know, how can some cities like Tampa has open restaurants figured out? Like they've got their booklet and their, you know, and then we talk to them and it's like, they, it's like they're eight streets and they've saved like the entire restaurant industry. Um, so I, I, I do think from a, from a planner perspective um, and, and people who understand that scale, um, it's incredibly important to be supportive um, and advocate 
for um, an understanding of how difficult these Im improvements can be. I mean, we really are um, grateful to um, all of the, the bids and the community groups who really help make this connection from you know, the kind of huge, large scale of the city, of the borough, um, and kind of bring it down to, to the ground, to the neighborhood, to the corridor scale. Um, but I do think, um, you know, just both in the planning and design world, but also in the advocacy world, um, we need to be more supportive um, and understanding of, of just how challenging these improvements can be, especially if we want to do it um, and we want to be making these challenges with communities. Um, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily happen overnight. And I, I'm certainly like, you know, um, the last person who would say like, slow something down, uh, given, um, you know, how, um, how challenging and, and long it feels um, for, these, for these projects to take. Um, but again, I just think advocating for, um, you know, time as an opportunity, um, as a way to, to genuinely engage um, with folks and to make really impactful incremental change on the ground that can actually um, and, and ultimately move the bar farther than had you just put um, an initial project in. And I think that's, um, that, that's really um, an exciting and important thing, um, uh, you know, again, as we kind of embark on a permanent program of open streets is that we actually don't know what open streets are. There's not a visual for an open street. Open streets is actually a process that will lead to a whole series of planning and design outcomes um, that will be um, tailored to, to individual, individual neighborhoods. Um, and I think there's a lot of, um, uh, of support needed uh, to also recognize that, you know, this city was built around um, the automobile and, um, sorry, excuse me, so many parts of this city um, were built around the automobile and so much development kind of continues to take place and we still get 90% of our goods um, by truck. Uh, and so it's also a reason to be thinking about incremental change um, because we still need to make sure that, um, you know, our streets can function and people can get goods um, and services and, and things like that. Um, but all the more to advocate, not only to change the shape of our streets, but to change also the other um, systems that impact our streets. So everything, you know, from the size of our fire trucks um, to more, you know, sanitation sweepers and things like that um, that can sweep bike lanes on the ground. Um, so both design, but then also all of the, the operational um, mechanical pieces that, that it takes to make our city and our streets work. And I actually want to just add one thing on to Emily's point, just because I, I think you hit on a really critical way that planners can advocate internally even. Um, having existed in city government in various forms at various times, uh, it's always amazing how little appreciation there is or attention there is to the kind of dirty operational things whether that be in a zoning code or within like a department, um, things like trash and freight don't get the kind of attention that things like bike lanes and sidewalk extensions get. And I, I certainly as fall, you know, fall more on the sidewalk and pedestrian extension side of the world, but um, understanding and paying strategic attention to those operational pieces of how New York City works and actually using that as a design generator and a design opportunity is I think going to be a really critical next step for this administration and for all of the agencies that work with it um, to realize this sort of larger vision for how streets can operate. Thank you for the comments and, and really great discussion. And I wanna open it to questions from uh, the participant from the audience here. Um, so I'm Looking at the chat, and we have a question for Emily um, uh, related to safety. So this year has been particularly deadly for New York City's pedestrian and cyclist. Are there any efforts to study safety impacts of open streets, um, for example, re reduction in crashes, speeding, et cetera? 
Yeah, I mean, it, um, it is a very, um, a very good question. Obviously, one that's on on top of mind um, for everyone at DOT. Um, I think I'll start by saying that one of the, you know, we started our kind of Broadway vision, um, kind of moving beyond the the jewels of the necklace of Broadway, the plazas, to thinking about all the other blocks um, pre-pandemic. And that's, we were starting our shared streets and our chicanes. And, you know, there was always this question of like, are we leaving the street flexible enough? Is this the right kind of design treatment? Um, and really the pandemic um, uh, really reinforced all of those design tools um, because when you, in, in many places, when you don't have a lot of people and cyclists on the road, um, it creates an environment for, for vehicles to speed all the more and not think about um, sharing the road. So I think the more um, we can be thinking and designing for self-enforcing slow speed environment. So despite what, um, you know, what conditions we have on the road, um, if neighborhoods and if certain corridors are um, this kind of self-enforcing slow speed um, corridor for, for pedestrians and cyclists, um, you know, I think that's a really, really important safety strategy um, citywide um, and definitely one one we are thinking about. Um, we're definitely, as we as we look to um, the, the permanent open street program um, and all of our kind of public space and, and, and public realm projects moving forward, um, the, the goal this year is to collect um, a lot more data um, and, and be more intentioned about um, a lot of the, the design treatments when we start putting more than just barricades on the road. Yeah, and I think, all sorry. Sorry, just to, to just to finish um, uh, one last thought to just to, to wrap it up together. Um, you know, I think having um, uh, building habits and a culture of use around these corridors um, that has been um, fraught in some places, very successful in other places. Um, in, in in many circumstances, it is because there is such a strong community steward. And that's built a real culture culture of use um, that we hope to to build upon. Um, but I also want to say, and this is something we've been we've been thinking about for a long time, um, and we want to definitely continue to advocate for um, these types of treatments. Um, not only creating um, safe environments for um, unintentional vehicular attacks, but how kind of take, or unintentional vehicular incidents, how we might be able to think about um, limited vehicles in zones as also being, um, you know, a, a safety and security layer from intentional vehicle attacks. And so that's definitely something um, you know, we're, we're at the threshold of thinking about just less vehicles on the street um, generally helps both for unintentional and intentional um, vehicular crashes. Yeah, that's a very good point um, related to congestion pricing and other efforts uh, to reduce the number of vehicles and, and the amount of vehicle mile traveled on our streets. Um, another uh, question or kind of comment here is related to climate change and thinking about our, our streets with a green infrastructure and how it's necessary to manage storm water, storm water runoff and reduce the increased health uh, impacts of urban heat islands. So any thoughts on that? I know, David, you started before related to uh, the need for more shade, but what other uh, design or elements we can introduce into our streets to uh, address climate uh, goals? Yeah, no, it's, I mean, and, and it's such an important question. I think ultimately it's a question that does take thinking well beyond streets also. I mean, a huge amount of energy has been put in by the city on um, heating and cooling systems, creating more sustainable heating and cooling systems, creating uh, more green roofs uh, around the city. Um, ultimately, from a sort of stormwater runoff perspective, uh, it's, it's really about creating a kind of network of pervious or semi-soft surfaces 
that's going to capture, treat, and manage stormwater, and then also manage flash flooding, which is something that we've um, you know been seeing more of in the city, especially at points that are sort of uh, at these kind of environmental pressure points. Um, I think that from a streetscape perspective, part of what we need to think about in reducing urban heat island uh, is experimenting with new and different materials. Um, more, uh, more parking lots that use pervious or semi-planted paving, which can be difficult to maintain, but are you know, far superior from an environmental perspective. Um, streets that are just built out to be more, to be much narrower or you know, use a pervious paving material in their parking lane. Um, and then uh, integrating stormwater capture, uh, planting and other elements into sort of um, these strategic points in, with, street, uh, with streetscape improvement projects. So places where you may have an opportunity to put a bulb out that has, uh, has a bioswale in it or places where uh, your shared street or your chicken may actually be also a solution that can help manage stormwater um, uh, and, 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 and even potentially kind of integrate some public seating into that. So, uh, you know, th there's, I think, a larger climate agenda um, that, you know, we need to think about citywide as well, which is this issue of rising sea levels. Uh, and there are a number of projects, obviously, uh, in Brooklyn and Manhattan that are starting to address this at a more systematic level that have been extremely controversial. Um, and that's going to be a, a real barometer over the next 10 years for how, you know, what the appetite of the public is to see considerable change in major parks along major roads uh, leading into the city to prevent something like Hurricane Sandy from happening again, causing that kind of devastation and damage. But there are a, there's a lot of low hanging fruit in the city, places that are underutilized that could have these sort of surgical interventions that are a part of a you know evolving toolkit from DOT that I think can ebb away at this larger issue of climate change, which obviously is not just a New York isolated issue, but something that's connected globally. And I'll just add, add really quickly to that. Um, you know, we've seen um, certainly over, over the years, um, neighborhoods with plazas kind of using their public spaces to help kind of recover um, or support uh, neighborhoods, um, you know, after climate events, whether it be Sandy or, um, you know, uh, events uh, distant in other in other countries and immigrant neighborhoods coming together and, and using their public space flexibly. Um, but I think again, you know, we've we have seen it with um, open restaurants and and open streets that um, we were facing a major global pandemic, and there were certain neighborhoods who were positioned to take advantage of a program to steward their streets. Um, and there were still many neighborhoods who weren't. And so I think, you know, there's obviously our realm is the, the, the design and planning side, but um, constantly thinking about um, the other uh, social systems and, and community cohesion that is ultimately needed um, for New York City to be resilient in, in times of, of crisis and how we can be um, supportive and, and advocate um, for, for those systems as well. Um, thank you very much. I, I want to bring Jennifer to the conversation with the comments here about the public um, and how to get um, communities that are often not um, heard, that it's hard to reach to, like seniors, people with disability, younger folks. Um, any ideas to, to that, uh, how to help along with engagement? Yeah, I mean, I think that there are a lot of um, like grassroots community groups, you know, whether they're tenant associations or block associations or merchant associations. I think it's, you know, it's, you'll, I think you'll find one in almost every neighborhood. Um, and those are the, the people that really live there. So um, I think that sort of as, you know, as when we do outreach or when, you know, when we do our, our placemaking work up here, we want to always make sure that it's really community driven. Um, and equitable. And so we make sure to go to, you know, all of the different local groups, whether that's the, 
you know, LAL, our, um, the Bangladeshi group, a community group across the, across the park. Um, and we go to the Tenant Association and Tracy Towers. And of course we work with the community board as well, but we also want to make sure that we're hitting those um, really grassroots um, groups of, of residents that really care about their, their neighborhood. Um, we also have a lot of, you know, the Bronx is the, the greenest borough. So we have a lot of friends groups that do um, beautification all over the place. So we just all, all, always make sure that we're engaging as many um, local community members as possible. Um, exactly, they're one of our favorite uh, groups. We actually just built a little edible garden next to next to my office with them and we grow food and give it out to the food, local food pantry. Um, so I think it's really about, yeah, the, cultivating those relationships with, with the, the hyper-local grassroots groups. Um, David, Emily, any other thoughts about how to build the community stewardships in these uh, processes? I mean, one, one thing that I'll just kind of add is that as planners and designers, we often think about engagement in the context of projects as opposed to the sort of context of larger activations and sort of ongoing communication. And I think that one of the things that, you know, from a sort of design and agency perspective that's really critical is really finding these kinds of opportunities to build something with communities, um, you know, whether that be, uh, and I think that the Neighborhoods Now program that Urban Design Forum has been coordinating, has, has been doing a great job of this, of bringing design voices into places that may not have the funds to, uh, you know, pay for a, a, a parklet or something and actually bringing, um, bringing people into that conversation uh, and actually kind of having an informal engagement process to uh, really uh, you know, de develop those relationships and to, to develop uh, community voices uh, from the ground up. And you know, the, the pandemic, I think, has been a time when more and more people at a grassroots level are getting involved. Uh, and anecdotally, I, um, I, I knew one person in, in the Lower East Side who was um, working as a, a lighting designer and saw so many empty storefronts and he decided uh, to start going door to door, uh, actually to communicate with these property owners, to find the landlords, to sort of do the groundwork to realize this kind of creative lighting installation. And I think that there are a lot of people out there that want to do something with the public space in their streets, with their parks, um, with areas that they see underutilized and that tapping into that potential, both for agencies, but then also for you know, design actors and design firms uh, is an incredibly powerful mechanism to sort of continually build up that coalition of people who can be advocates for better streets, safer streets, and more active streets. So we are at time. I just want to say uh, thank you very much to all the panelists for their great input and insights and example that we can learn from. I want to bring it back to Kathy from the APA to close up. Hello. Oh, am I upside down right now? <laughs> Not sure how to fix that, but <laughs> uh, just wanted to say thank you all so much for, for joining us and participating in our conversation. I know there are a lot of planners on the line here, um, part of APA and open plans that um, can hopefully use some of these tactical strategies to improve their streets and, and their communities and support the economic uh, recovery in New York. So uh, thank you again. Have a great rest of the day and we'll see you all later. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.